And we were, and had been for a very long time, in a, in a place of crisis as a family. And I was very, very tired. I'd come to the point where I thought I would go mad or drop. No one understands you uh, from the outside. No one had any idea about the kind of life that we were living. And then I, and, and I just, I cracked. pretty much since Tim had been born, had lived not a normal life. He didn't sleep properly for about five, six years. He was an inconsolable baby. He would scream and scream as though he was in pain, but the doctors couldn't find anything wrong with him. When he did go to sleep, we were absolutely terrified he was going to wake up. We couldn't leave him, we couldn't go anywhere, we couldn't be apart from him. So for many, many years, that's the way that we lived. It was very, very tough on us, um, our relationship, because we didn't have any time for ourselves. For a long time, there was not a lot of intimacy, there was not a lot of um, emotional connection because of the, the crisis that we were in as a family. When he was about nine, eight or nine, and he hadn't been to school because we realized that he would have been diagnosed with hyperactivity or a lack of ability to concentrate because we could see he couldn't even sit down to eat a meal he would run around the table take a mouthful run around the table and when i taught him his numbers we would do it in the garden i'd ask him a sum as he ran up the garden and he'd answer coming down the garden and this is how i taught him he never sat on my lap or um, lay in bed while i had a bedtime story he would walk around the carpet touching his favorite bits going round and round and round. And as long as I would keep reading, he'd just keep walking round and round, touching his favorite bits. Everything was timed so he knew where he was in the day, what was going to happen next, and the routine had to be very structured. His sleeping had always been a huge issue. He'd wake up after he'd been asleep for an hour or two, and he would jump up screaming in terror and run around the house, but he didn't recognize me. If I went towards him to comfort him, he would see me as a monster or something and he would be terrified so it was counterproductive. I just have to stand back and wait for him to calm down. It was just another one of the things that we just dealt with and didn't think much about, but it was quite an issue. When we had James, many people have said to us, You'll surely not get another child who doesn't sleep, who sleeps as badly as Timmy did. I noticed one or two strange things when he got to be 18 months and then he started spinning round and round, moving his head round and when I changed his nappy he'd flap, 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 flap. And then instead of pushing the cars, we had action man cars, big ones, he'd turn them upside down and spin the wheels for ages. So there were a few little odd things, but not enough to really I would just facilitate his peculiarities and thought it was okay. But when he stopped talking and he stopped communicating and then he stopped liking people look at him and he became distressed with light and then he stopped eating foods and if there was even the smallest lump in his morning porridge, he'd gag and vomit it up. Then we had a speech and language therapist come in to assess Timothy. And there were two of them, and they were chatting to Tim, trying to put him at ease and stuff, and then chatting to me to report back what they had found. And they were watching James, who was playing with his trains. He loved trains, it was his favorite toys. Anyway, what they said to me was, oh, isn't it funny how autistic kids love trains? And I said, autistic kids? So she says, well, it's obvious, isn't it? You did know, didn't you? I said, no, he's not autistic. So she says, oh, I think you should perhaps have him assessed. He shows a number of autistic characteristics. And that's the first I had even thought of it. I was absolutely gutted. In the days following this 2005 assessment, Timothy was tested and diagnosed with a form of autism called Asperger's syndrome, while his younger brother James exhibited all the symptoms of autistic spectrum disorder. 
and we suddenly realised that, gosh, we, we were going to have two children that got it, and what were the chances of that? I, I did know that I was really struggling. I wasn't living a normal life myself. I'd lost touch with who I was. I just functioned 24 hours a day as caring for these boys. So I was plowing a lot of my energies into my job because I needed to make sure that that was successful to be able to support the family. That meant travelling a lot. And I thought if anyone found out my state of mental health, they'd take the children away. And I was absolutely terrified of them taking the children away. But I was also terrified that I couldn't go on. And that's when I cried out to the Lord. I said, if you don't help me now, I'm, I'm finished. The incredible pressure and the incredible um, trauma that you, you, you undergo as a family. You have to watch your, your children, the, the, the things you love most in the world, battling not just with uh, the, the, the curse that they've got, but also being rational enough to know that they've got it. And it was those periods in which Debs found it the most hard, in which she had the darkest days. And it was during one of those dark, dark days that she watched the Mother's Day um, program. They were all mums talking about their kids and they were talking about, and they were showing snapshots and pictures and talking about the, which ones are doing what at school and they were chatting. And it just hit me like, like a sledgehammer that what I'm experiencing and what they're experiencing are just so different. And I was weeping and then I said, you know, why don't you help us? I had been asking God help me for, for years. And I said, I love my boys so much and you're supposed to love them more than me. Why have you done this to them? And I said, I would die for my boys. And that's when he said, I already did. I was so stunned, I just shut up. I didn't, I stopped crying. I just looked into the fireplace and I just stared there. I thought, that really wasn't my thought. <laughs> that really, that was Jesus talking to me. Oh, and that's when I knew that they were all right. And I thought, well, he'll heal them. I just sat there and stared at the fireplace. The tears went, the pain went, the anxiety went, the fears went. Everything that had worried me over the past number of years, it was like a huge load was just cut away and I was free and I felt light and I just sat and stared into that fireplace. And from that moment on, that despair, that terror, the anxiety that I'd lived with was gone. When Timothy went to the, the school that was funded by the, um, uh, the state, it was a really huge thing for us, but we felt that he was actually quite capable of doing it. And as he progressed and as they imp increased the number of hours he went, he was up for it. And I believe that the healing just took place gradually as and when his world opened up and became wide and he needed to cope with more and more things. It's almost as if he was covered in scales. He was covered in the scales of autism and over time those scales have been peeled away. And I was saying, Lord, please send me someone to help me. I know you're healing my boys, but I don't know what to do. And that was where we were at when my mum phoned and said, watch Andrew Womack. He's got this, some healing testimonies and you've got to watch it. And we all watched it together and it was just extraordinary. And even that, you sit and watch it and you think, well, is it really true? We had missed the beginning of Hannah's story, but we came in and from where we saw was enough to see what had taken place with Hannah's story. And the bit that struck me and was when he said, piece of cake for Jesus. Piece of cake for Jesus? This is a piece of cake for Jesus. And this smile crept across his face and I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> this guy really believes this, doesn't he? You know, and that faith on the inside of us rose up. So Father Jamie and I just agree and we thank you that by the stripes of Jesus, Hannah has already been healed. It just, my faith just, faith just rose up inside of me. And I thought, yes, he's talking about my God, my one. And that's when Christopher jumped up and went to check out the website. We researched Hannah's, Hannah and her story. And we found out about 
Hannah's grandparents and Hannah's mom and dad going to live in, I think, in America, and their the grandparents going to the college in Warsaw. It didn't just have an impact on Hannah, it had an impact on this incredible family and, and, and they were all, they'd all experienced it and they'd all gone through this process and again you're then thinking to yourself, wow, you know, maybe this, maybe this is all true, maybe this is really happening. And from that point on, started to watch Andrew Wormack every day, but we bought all his books or as many books as we could get, um, started to record his programs, watch him on the internet and we started to build up a kind of trust, I suppose, um, in what he was saying and in what he was saying we could have. And he shouted from the study, he's going to be in Warsaw in two weeks. So I thought, well, we'll just have to pray about it. So I phoned Andrew Wormack Ministries and I spoke to a woman there and I told her the situation. I said, look, we want to come. We want Andrew to pay for our sons, but we just need some help to get there. And I remember she said to me, what can you believe for? I think we can get there, but I'm not sure that I can exercise my faith enough to see us getting into the building. So she said, that's fine, we'll get you there, and if we can't get them out of the car, we'll send a prayer team to the car. I thought, yes. <laughs> and she prayed in a way that I had never heard before. And it was great, it was authoritative, it was thanking God that it was done, it was commanding, and I thought, now we're talking. I have not heard this kind of praying. And I was so thrilled, I put down the phone and I said, she said that this is going to happen and this is going to happen and we're going to sleep and he's going to eat. And Krista was like, yeah, <laughs> she's never met my son. <laughs> and for the next two weeks, I made a calendar counting down. This is when we're going to go and stay in a hotel. And he would cry every time I said it's another day. And when I said, no, we're going, he'd get in the spinning chair and he'd spin and spin and spin. And he'd refuse to come out for hours sometimes. But the day came and he whipped and he whipped and he physically was trying not to get into the car. It was hard work. But I just sat down and I prayed about it and I said, Lord, they said that he'd be able to get in the car and that he'd be fine and that you'd calm him and comfort him and all would be well. And so we're coming. And it was amazing because he just smiled up and said, OK, I'm ready, let's go. And we strapped him in and he sat there. Christopher and I just kept looking at each other and sort of, holding our breath, it was amazing. We booked into the hotel and he was bouncing on the bed. He was really excited, like this is an adventure. And once again, Timothy was like, he couldn't believe it. And we said, okay, we're going to go and eat at the Kentucky Fried Chicken that the Terradez has ate at. So we were off to the Kentucky Fried Chicken. And that's when Timothy ordered himself some popcorn chicken. We didn't know what to order James, so we thought, well, we won't bother with anything because if we offer him food and he doesn't like it, he starts heaving. Sat down and he looked at the food. There was no heaving, there was no watery eyes and that he would normally have with cooking smells. He sat there, he looked at the popcorn chicken, he said, what that? And he said, it's something called popcorn chicken. He said, oh, chicken, chicken. And he had one. Mmm, he said, he said, Timmy, mine. <laughs> and he ate. And when he was finished it, he said, more, more. He ate a second lot. He probably ate more than I'd ever seen him eat in one sitting, ever. He ate the chips, he ate the chicken. <laughs> and we, Christopher and I were just laughing and said, it's a miracle and we haven't even got there yet. And it was an answer to prayer. It was what she had prayed was happening. And so then we got to the meeting and he, he was absolutely fine to come out the car. We sat in the coffee shop it, it was tea time and there was this long queue of people. They wanted Andrew to sign books or pray for them and what have you. I called Christopher and he got James and all four of us stood in that queue. And I was moving slowly along and there were about five people in front of us when Andrew said, right, it's time to get back, tea break's over. Will everyone please go and sit down? I was like, no, 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 no. And I started crying. I just, it was like the taps just opened. I thought, no. No, I'm not going home now. I'm not. I'm not. I can't go home now. I said, oh Lord, help me, help me, help me. I'm not going home without this man praying for my sons. And then that was when Paul Flanagan saw us and he grabbed us and he shoved us in front of Andrew and said, Andrew, just one more. And he said, right, okay, one more. And we told him the situation and he said a, a prayer, something along the lines. It was literally as quick as this. He rebuked autism and he commanded healing. And then he blessed us as a family and he thanked the Lord that we were blessed and that we would, um, something along the lines of, of, of fulfill the, the God's plan for our lives. 
And then he said to Christopher and I, and this was so huge, he said to Christopher and I, you are now the parents of normal, healthy children. And uh, everything happened so quickly. I remember hearing that like the whole world went quiet and it was just these words. It was, I, to me, and I still believe it, it was Jesus talking to me. And so that was a promise. That was a promise. That was, I, I, that was for me. And I knew that he was right. And I was so moved. And we just slipped out the side door, got in the car, and we went to McDonald's where James ate the chicken nuggets and the chips. <laughs> I think he'd never eaten for well he'd never eaten and we went home he went across the road to the little girl who he had known but hadn't played with for over a year invited her around and they played in the sand pit on the trampoline in the garden he played for the rest of the afternoon and that was the time that night that he had the first complete full peaceful unbroken night sleep since the day he was born and he was five years old at that point but when Three months later, he's still sleeping well. When six months later, when a year later, two years later, he's still sleeping well. And, he, and he's starting to become the child that you thought, that you knew was there, but you couldn't reach because of um, autism. Um, you believe in it and believe in the process. And those experiences have allowed us to start to live a normal, a more normal life. So for me, it was very important for us to, to take the boys back to the psychologist, the people who diagnosed them in the first place, because we, we knew there was something wrong with them, but we didn't label them Asperger's and autism. That was done by the, 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 the professionals. He was taken to see the uh, psychologist, and she spent an hour with him, an hour and a half chatting to him. And at the end of it, there was no, there was no battle, there was no fight. It was patently obvious that he wasn't the boy that had been diagnosed all those years ago. And um, what they said in the official medical report, confidential medical report from the NHS uh, trust where we lived, was that um, Timothy is a neurodevelopmentally typical young man and the label of Asperger's syndrome is not applicable. He has been discharged from my care. <laughs> and that is, to see it written down, to see it and I know this sounds awful, but to see it official really, really brings it home. So as James developed and as James came out of um, his, um, his illness and came out of his uh, disease, uh, we wanted to do the same as well. And we were expecting probably an even worse fight with James because um, we thought, again, we're going to take on the might of the state here. And these professionals aren't keen on being proven wrong, particularly with something like autism, because it is regarded as being something that can't be cured. And so when we went to see the psychologist, she said, well, this is wrong. This diagnosis is, is, is obviously not, not applicable to him. He's a normal boy. He has, he's perfectly capable of dealing and being what you would regard as, as normal. So she wrote uh, in her official confidential uh, psychology report that we only had uh, last week, as a result of our discussions and my interactions and observations with James during our appointment, it is clear there has been, been significant progress over time in all areas associated with the triad, triad of impairment with autism. As a result, the label Autism Spectrum Disorder is no longer appropriate for James and should be removed from any documentation in the future that relates to him. And, and you just, you know, you can't, when I read that, you just, I just, I just want to start, I just want to start crying really, because it's just, it's not just what we've experienced, and it's not just that we know it, but because this is now official, it means that forever and ever, so when we've gone, when the boys are men, when they're old and they're gray, they will not have this with them. They will not have carried this burden that they've had to carry in their young lives. They are free of it, and the, the, the authorities, if you like, have recognized that as well, and they won't be persecuted or hindered in any way for what has happened when they were children. And, and I suppose for us, well for me certainly, that's the best thing that we could do for them. The best thing that we can do for both boys is to give them a future that we didn't think that they were going to have. And this gives us that future.
Sometimes you, you have to pinch yourself to think, well, am I actually with the same two children you know, that were born to me? Because the, the change in, in the way that we play and the change in the way that they relate to me is, is, is very pronounced. And I used to dream about all four of us going out to dinner together and, and not worrying about anything, just like a normal family. I used to dream that if we were invited out to fam other people's houses, we'd all just go and it would be fine. There wouldn't be no fallout, nothing. We'd just be able to go. I used to dream about going to the cinema and eating popcorn and boys eating popcorn and watching a movie together as a family. All, none of these things had we ever done before. But we went to the cinema, we bought the popcorn, we did it just as I had imagined. We are a normal family and I am the mother of normal healthy children, just like Andrew said. So that's it. Happy, happy. <laughs>